you have your Bible, turn to the book of James with me this morning, please. Chapter 1 and verse 1. James 1 1. The scripture says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Father, I pray that you'd anoint this holy word now as it goes forth. And it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. In thy righteous name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle James tells us in verse number eight that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That word double-minded there means an uncertainty about the truth or something or anything, doubting, hesitating all the time, constantly being driven by fear and insecurity and unknowingness, uh, agnosticism, for example, is a good example of that. The double-minded man, therefore, is an unstable man because he has no foundation. He really doesn't know whether he's coming or going, doesn't know where he is, how he got there. He has no idea. He may know how to go about his daily affairs and his job and do a good job at it. But as far as his soul is concerned, he has no anchor. He has no anchor. He's adrift on the sea of life. He's here today. He's there today. Another place tomorrow. He believes this latest fad of theology or he latches on to this uh, next spiritual thing that rises up. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. That describes the average American. Double-minded men, as some have said, 50 miles long, 50 miles wide, and a quarter of an inch deep. That's about the, that, uh, that just about recognizes what we're dealing with when it comes to the American psyche. But I'm gonna call your attention to verse Number seven, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. What does it take therefore to receive something from God? Would you like to be able today to receive what God has promised in his holy word? And Gloria Howe went to the doctor this past week. They did a CAT scan, whatever it was they did, and they came back with a clean bill of health. That's right. And she was worried about that and came back with a clean bill of health. Benny Joslin was, uh, was uh, uh, they did their, their uh, uh, test on him and he came back 100% clean and cured of cancer. By the way now, you need to understand that they didn't do one thing to cure him from cancer. All they did was diagnose the fact that God had already done it. Amen. And you just heard the testimony of uh, Shannon McDonald this morning who says that a miracle has been performed in her life. And this brother sitting on the second row here now, is your back still okay? And he hurt continuously for a long time with that back. And now, but God has raised him up with a miracle. You see, when you preach the word of God and the anointing of God is present, people get saved, people get healed, people get delivered. All kinds of things happen because of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And so I give him glory today. Don't ever let some dried up, dead orthodox uh, preacher or teacher tell you that God does not perform miracles today. Hogwash. If you're born again today, that's the greatest miracle in the world. Amen. 
Because if you know anything about people, you know people don't change their lives. They may change their circumstances for a little while, like Pharaoh did. He wanted to spend one more night with the frogs, but after that, he wanted out of there. Well, that's the way most people are. If they get their immediate circumstances changed, they'll revert right back to what they were before. But to see a life completely change, once and for all and forever, never to be the same again. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That, my dear friend, is a miracle. So the Apostle James tells us, let not that man think that he can receive anything from the Lord. In the, book of, uh, in the book of Matthew, we read about the man who was at the pool of Bethesda. He'd been there 38 years, and he could not get into the water. The waters were probably fed by the same waters that fed the pool of Siloam. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked at him and knew he'd been in that way for a long time. Ask him a simple question. Wilt thou be made whole? He will communicate with you if you let him. Wilt thou be made whole? But after all, if God did something for you and if he, if he healed you, if he saved you, delivered you, did something, you wouldn't have anything to grab about then, would you? Amen. There's an awful lot of people who wouldn't know what to do if they didn't grab all day long. Amen. Try glorifying God. Try let praises come forth from the mouth that cursed him. Try that one time and you'll be amazed at how it changes you. The widow of Nain was following a casket and her only son lay dead. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked at her and understood her condition because that was her hope. She was literally hopeless. And he walked up and he was the only one in the whole Bible that could do it. He reached up and touched that casket that held the body of that dead man. A priest, if he had done that, he would have been contaminated. The, the, this, the guilt, the sin, the death would have been transferred from that into the priest, but not the Lord Jesus Christ because glory was going forth from him and he raised him from the dead. And some of you need to be raised from the dead. Then there is that lost one. The Bible tells us that he leaves the 90 and nine and he goes out to find that one which is lost. 90 and nine, we sing about it in our book. And here's the sad thing about so many lost people. They have no clue they're lost. Have you ever heard of, uh, of, of Godfrey Bowen? How many of you have ever heard of a country called New Zealand? Would you raise your hand? New Zealand is in the other part of the world. It's there next to the down under at Australia. Godfrey Bowen was an expert when it came to sheep. Nobody knew more about sheep than Godfrey Bowen. He wrote a book. It's called Why the Shepherd. I recommend it highly to any of you. Get the CD-ROM. It's got it on there. And it's called Why the Shepherd by Godfrey Bowen. It's a marvelous book. He talks about four different kinds of sheep in that book. And I'm going to call your attention to them this morning. Sheep are peculiar. They need a shepherd. They don't go out into the wild. Sheep do not live in the wild. They are domestic animals and they need a shepherd to watch over them. There is the lost sheep as we're talking about or the wandering sheep. They're constantly straying away from the flock and they get out somewhere and they get lost and they're on the rocks or they may wander into a different flock. And this is what happens to a lot of Christians, folks. They never put roots down. They never root themselves. Not in me, not in this building, not in this, in the Lord. That's where you put your roots. You put them in the Son of God. And so my dear friend, the uh, Godfrey talks about the lost ship. Then he talks about the hermit sheep. What is a hermit sheep, preacher? It's a sheep that goes out and does not like to stay with the flock and goes out on its own and gets out in the wild. And here, my dear friend, make no mistake about this. A sheep coming up against a wolf doesn't stand a chance. It has no defense. As a matter of fact, of all the creatures that God put on this earth, a sheep is one of the most helpless and defense, and with no defense of all the other creatures. And a lot of Christians get like that. They get like hermit sheeps, sheep, and they just simply go out into the world and the world consumes them and they're done away with. Then there's the cast sheep. That's a remarkable thing. So what is that, preacher? A cast sheep is a sheep that has gone out somewhere in a trench or in the field and it has picked up stuff in its, in its, in its, in its, in its, uh, 
in its wool and, and it's begin to bake and cake on there and, and the sheep is unable because of the weight of all of this to pull itself up and pull itself free and it winds up upside down on its back with its feet sticking straight up in the air and the shepherd must go out and find the cast sheep. A lot of sheep are like that, dear friend. They're cast sheep. They have literally been overtaken and overcome by the world and they can no longer help themselves. They need the shepherd to come to them. You see, my dear friend, this is why the Lord Jesus is called the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. This is why we call preachers like me the under shepherd because I must watch over the flock. This is what it says in the book of Hebrews. They watch for your souls. It is my responsibility to stand in the gap between you and hell out here that wants to destroy you. Like this I just read about this beautiful ark, the reproduction they have built in Kentucky and the stinking devils that want to come against it and deprive these children of a good lesson in history. This is the enemy, my dear friend. I make no mistake. I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot of things happen in the world. And now you may judge me wrong for what I'm about to say, but I'm going to tell you what I feel like in my soul, deep in my soul. I'm so sick and tired of people talking about, well, they just see things in a different way. They're the loyal of opposition. You know, they're not like us, but we've got to respect them. Let me tell you something. They're devils. They're wolves. They are no longer just an American out there that doesn't see it the way you do. They're demon-possessed devils that want your children and they will destroy everything that you hold precious in your heart and in your soul. I got no patience for them and no room for them. When they come out against my Lord Jesus Christ and against that Bible and against what I know to be true, I am their enemy and they are my enemy and I look at them as such. This is why when I go to the polls in November, I'm not voting against an opposing politician. I'm voting against the enemy. They've already said I'm their enemy and that's where it's come down to. You live in a critical time in this country. Quit playing games. Your children are going to pay dearly for what you do in the next few years. Cast sheep they are. And then there's that last one. Oh, what kind of a sheep is that, preacher? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a ram, an, a, a mature ram. And they need something when they get ready to slaughter the sheep that will lead all the rest of the sheep into the place of slaughter. And so they get them one sheep and that sheep is a ram and it's called a Judas sheep. Oh yeah, Judas. And that Judas sheep leads all the rest of them into the slaughter. Boy, this is why I spend the last few years of my life, however it may be months in my life, it may be weeks in my life, I don't know when it is, but God knows and that's all I care. I want you to understand something and hear me well. The last few times I've got on this earth, it's going to be spent preaching the truth and standing for the truth of the Word of God. I'm going to be judged in eternity for what I preach to you and what I believe and where I stand. Game time is over with. I will not be a Judas sheep. I will use the time that God's given me and I will use it wisely to preach the truth. I will come against with everything that is in me these lying, stinking devils that are trying to take everything that's precious that you have away from the friend. Now listen to me. They will destroy you and they're going to do it soon and they have, no, they have no mercy. When they start to do it, they will come after you and destroy Destroy your faith in the Lord. The time will come when America outlaws the gospel. And if you get up and preach Christ and preach the Bible, they will throw you in jail for hate speech. That day is soon coming. And I wonder, my dear friend, what the church is going to do when their pastors are locked up behind bars for preaching the truth. Will you wake up then? 
Quit listening to your politicians. Get on your knees and start talking to God. You had grandmothers and grandfathers, great grandmothers and great grandfathers, mothers and fathers that handed something good to you. They gave you something real good. They handed their faith down to you. What have you done with it? Have you compromised yourself for the stinking filthy world? You don't have forever. Every one of you are going where I'm going. We're going to stand before God and we're going to be judged for the truth of the word of God. My life and my message is either leading men away from God or leading them toward God. It is either tearing their faith down or it's building their faith up. This is why I said what I did about this ark. They're lying, stinking devils. They don't care anything about you. This this stuff is out here to destroy your faith. They're the enemy. They're demon possessed. Take your stand. Amen. 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 Then there is the abandoned. Oh my goodness, the abandoned. In the Old Testament, the Bible said he walked by and saw a babe in its own blood. It had been born, cast aside, and lay with no pity. No one saw any pity. Oh, boy, when I think about a baby laying in its own blood. And the Bible said when he called by, he walked by, he looked at it, and he said, Live! A voice of command said, Live! And that child came up and lived that was covered in its own blood. Oh, boy, what a thing. How do you think he feels? about the killing of 70 million babies in this country. What do you think God thinks about the wholesale slaughter of innocent children? Any government that will in, any government that will approve of the wholesale slaughter of innocent babies will cut your throat. They will euthanize you when the time comes and you're nothing but a piece of meat to any government that will allow the killing of unborn children, whether Democrat or Republican. And get ready, the day's coming because your turn will come. They've already started in Europe. They've started in Europe deciding who lives and who doesn't live. And when people get up to a certain age, they cut off the medicine. They cut off the funds and they cut them off and say, now go on and die. We got young people to take care of. That's euthanasia. It starts with the killing of the innocent unborn. Little helpless children. 70 million of them have died in this bloody country at the hands of butchers for expediency's sake. They'll come back and argue and say, preacher, what do you think about rape? What do you about think about incest? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Don't you think you have a place for all of that? Thank you, brother. Don't you think you've got a place for all of that? Do you realize that less than something like 1%, less than 1% of all the abortions that happen in this country are related with incest or with rape or with anything like that? that the vast majority of the abortions that take place in America are simply for expediency. That's, that's horrible. Would God approve of that? WWJD, what would Jesus do when it comes to the killing of babies? Amen. Then there's the desperate. There was the Syrophoenician who came to the Lord Jesus and said, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And here, my friend, is when we begin to understanding about the heart of God and how you receive something from, the, something from the Lord. It's been years that this lady over here has suffered. Years, my dear friend. She would call us up and I would pray with her on the phone. She would talk to our family and I knew she was hurting. She would say, Preacher, would you remember me today? She would send us a text message and say, This is not a good day. I'm hurting today. I'd call her name out before the Lord time and time and time again. Here's the point. You don't stop. You don't quit. You don't give up. The doctor's word is never the last word. I don't care if he tells you got 24 hours to live. It's not up to him. All he's got is his books. I've got God. Sometimes the doctor will agree with you. This town's full of good doctors that love the Lord. Christian doctors. But make no mistake about it. It is ultimately in the hands of Almighty God. And I want you to know something about this. When you are desperate 
And when you get desperate, as the Syrophoenician woman was, God will pull faith out of you that you didn't even know was there. She came to the Lord with a daughter that was grievously vexed with the devil. And all the disciples around said to themselves, what's this woman doing here? She's a Syrophoenician. She's not a daughter of David. She's not a virgin daughter of Zion. Who is she? Who does she think she is? Lord, she said, my daughter is grievously vexed. He looked at her and he said, it's not meet to take the bread of the children and give it to dogs. Have you ever had that answer from God? Have you ever had the heavens turn silent? Have you ever had them turn to brass? Have you prayed for something that you knew was right and legitimate and you knew that God had a promise in his word for it and that you knew that God said he'd do something about it and yet you prayed it and you didn't hear anything and nothing changed and then your faith was put into the furnace of fire. It was there through affliction that you were tried but it's there in affliction that you come forth in a different person. It is there that you come out understanding something about God. Let me tell you something this morning, folks. Amen. I want you to hear me and hear me well, please. These people right here, these devils, these demon-possessed devils, this enemy, they don't want you to see that ark. You know why? Let me tell you why. Because they have already decided in their soul they don't want any light. They don't want any light. This is the condemnation. He said in John chapter number one, light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light. Oh, how our churches have categorized everything. Oh, how we've laid everything out. We got it all figured out. No, we don't. The more I serve him, the more I love him. I serve a God today who's a merciful, long-suffering, compassionate God. I don't have him figured out, but I've learned something about him. When he says he's going to do something, he'll do it. I've learned that he says, I'll stick with you, he'll stick with you. I've learned that when God deals with a human soul, he deals with a human soul on a much higher level than you can even comprehend in your mind. He's laid it out in the New Testament. There are passages here and there and here and there throughout the New Testament where God is dealing with a human soul but it doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit what you want to hear preached in the churches. So they don't fool with it. But I'll tell you right now, the more I know him, the more I love him. These kids that are being saved over here in North Carolina, a thousand people have been born again in North Carolina in the camp meeting. Do you believe a thousand of them were born again? I would rejoice with you and turn flips if a thousand had, but maybe a hundred really got born again. Maybe 150, maybe 200, who knows? That's between God and them. Listen to me, please. If six months from now or a year from now, word card starts coming back, how well, you know, a lot of them, they, they wouldn't go to church and we couldn't get them baptized. We couldn't do anything with them. They just got caught up emotionally with the time, with the hour. Do you think that's going to bother me one bit? Not one bit. Because I know the God that I serve still loves them regardless of whether they follow through or not. I know that the God that I serve is able to save to the uttermost all that come to God, everyone that comes to Christ. Maybe that's their first encounter with anything spiritual in their young lives. Maybe it's a fad with them right now but it has awakened to something inside their soul that had never been spoken to before. And maybe it will put them on a journey that two or three or four or five, God forbid it take that long, years from now they come to a real saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are you rejoicing about, preacher? I'm rejoicing about the God they come to because he will do right by every one of them. Did you hear that? Some of you have tried the altar. You're good at the altar. You've worn it out. But it just didn't give you what you thought you should have received. Some of you have been prayed for, prayed with, fasted, done this, done that. But it didn't give you what you expected. Some of you are disillusioned with church, sick and tired of it. Walk out the door. Don't miss it. Had enough of this religious stuff. But I have never in my life ever met anyone 
that ever got bored with God? Nope. It's always I tried, I did, I this, I that, and it didn't work out, and I here, I, but it's never, you know something, I met somebody that I haven't yet figured out, but I love him more by the day. I met somebody's a whole lot bigger than I am. I met somebody that stuck with me when he didn't need to stick with me. I didn't deserve him sticking with me. I met somebody that I could pray to and I've seen him answer prayers. I've watched people walk up and down through here and shout and praise God. Now they're laying drunk. Does that cause me to stop preaching? No. No. You see, when they were shouting and praising God, the same God they were shouting and praising to when they were shouting and praising God is the same God that now they're laying drunk. He hadn't changed. I changed not, he said. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I'm glad for that immutability of God. Oh, how I am. Because men can be one thing one day and something else the next day. And they can change with the seasons. Yes, sir. The desperate, then the downtrodden. Mark chapter number 10, verse 46. Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside begging. And my friend, that's where sin and the curse will always bring you. Begging. Now, do you want to receive from God? I'm going to give you four things and I'll come to a close this morning. Do you want to receive from him? Do you want to be able to receive from God? Well, let me give you number one. And what is that, preacher? That's patience. Patience. What is that? It's hard for people today to have any patience because this is a push button. Instant gratification. Instant gratification. Patience. The Bible said, tribulation worketh patience. There's a lot of tribulations that are going to come into your life that you can't explain, that you don't feel like that you are, that you're justly, that you're being dealt with justly. Things that happen to us that we have no explanation for. But persevere. Wait on him. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. In his time, his way, and his place, he will choose to manifest himself to you. And when that day comes, you'll be a much happier Christian for it. For when that day comes, you'll learn something about God that'll help you pray, that'll strengthen your faith, that'll draw you closer to him, that you'll learn about him. You see, people are looking for formulas and you don't get them here at Temple. I don't believe in formulas. You say, what about the Romans road? That's what got me saved. No, God saved you. They just happened to point a few scriptures out to you in the Romans road. The Galatians road is as good as the Romans road. As a matter of fact, the Isaiah road is just as good as the Galatians road. You see, people like formulas because they like to box everything in and they like to cut and they like to be able to pronounce something on you. That's having control over you. Now, well, you said the words, you're saved. You believed this should happen. You know, you did what God said to do. There's no more to do. I remember a man took a gun, blew his brains out, put one to each head. Bang. A man of God, too. He's on fire as much as any I've ever known. Preached in this church many times. Got down on his knees one morning, put a gun on both sides of his head and blew his brains out. Where'd he go, preacher? He went same place Samson went. Where's that? Read, read Hebrews 11. Samson that killed himself shows up in Hebrews 11 and Solomon's name's not in there. All right. So he gets up and he blows his brains out. All right. He's gone. He's gone. He's with the Lord. I preached his funeral. This man, this man went down a hard road. He got into deep depression. He would lock himself into his room for days at a time. He would go out and preach revival meetings and come back and he'd go straight to that room and he'd shut the door and he'd turn the lights out and he'd stay in that dark, depressing hole. He just couldn't seem to come out of it. He couldn't seem to get any help from it. And so eventually it got him to the point to where there was no help for him, that there was nothing. And he blew his brains out. I, 
I firmly feel like God wanted me to go over there. And I called him and I tried to go over there and I wanted to get in that room with him and I wanted to get down on the floor with him and I wanted to pray. The power of God was moving here at Temple Baptist Church, moving powerfully. And I wanted to go in there and lay my hands on him. And I wanted to lay my hands on him and say, Lord God, anoint him and drive this hell out of his soul and give this man some light and lift him up and bring him out of here. But I never could get in there. I couldn't get in there to pray with him. I prayed for him many, 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 many times. And then I got up out there at Temple Baptist Church and I preached his funeral. And his life was over here in this world. His ministry was finished. He blew his brains out. You say, well, that's, that's a terrible defeat. That's a horrible thing. Don't be too quick to judge. You may blow your brains out before your life is over. Earth and this world may dish up stuff to you that you never thought existed. It may come your way. And when it does come your way, most of the time you're ill prepared to receive it or deal with it. Oh no, oh no, no, no. But here was the point about this. Here's the point. This is so instructive. We were talking to one of the big evangelists in the country. His name's everywhere. He's all over everything. He's never meeting. He's all over the place. He's, every, he's, he's in everybody's newspaper, blah, 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 blah. We're talking to him about this evangelist that blew his brains out. And here's what he said. Here was his answer. Well, we prayed for him. We tried. We did everything we could. You know, what more can you do? And that was his answer. You see? That was his answer. Here was his answer. Here's his answer. Let me, let me interpret it for you. Well, you know, we did what we're supposed to do. We had it categorized. We gave him the Romans road. You know, we said what we're supposed to say. We laid hands. We did this. We did that. And so forth. There's no more we can do. Oh, yes, there's a whole lot more you can do. Get out of your box. Get out of your formulas and get a hold of a God that's able to shake heaven and earth and can move mountains. There's a whole lot more you can do. You can get a hold of the one who calls the sun up in the morning and calls the moon up at night that brings babies into this world and gives life to humanity and saves the human soul. Call on the one who is able to answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. He will, he can, he will answer you. Stop listening to people and get a hold of God. And get a hold of him. Get a hold of him. Oh, his answer was as infantile and as cheap and as superficial and as categorical as you could possibly give. It was as meaningless as it could be. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying to this very day when I drive down the interstate, every time I drive down through there, I look up into the hill on my left-hand side and I know his grave's right up there and I grieve for him. Every time I drive by there, I remember that place right above the interstate and I know right over that hill is his grave and I know he didn't need to be there and I grieve for him. Never forget him. Never forget him. That's what life's about. That's what life's about right there. There's an intersection right down the road from here on Merchants Road. You can go to that intersection and there's a gas station right there on the corner at that intersection. A grandmother took her son, a grandson, a grandmother took her grandson into the bathroom in that place and she killed, murdered her son and then murdered herself right there in that room. She shot her little grandson to death and then shot herself to death right there inside that gas station. Every time I go through that intersection, I look over at that gas station and I think about that heinous deed that, was, that, was, that happened inside that building. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And in that same intersection, by the way, one of the men who used to come to our church right here got killed on a motorcycle right there in that intersection. Uh, his life was cut short and, and, and he went on to be with the Lord. So two events have happened at that one intersection every time I drive by there. But the one that gets me the most is the one where that grandmother killed her grandson. And I say to myself, every time I see it, I think, you didn't have to do that. that you thought that was the only out. You thought that was the only thing you could do. I don't know, what, I don't know the, what was going on in the family. I don't know. Some of you have drug addict daughters. Some of you have drug addicted sons. Some of you have drug addicted husbands. You've got drug addicted wives. That's the reality of it. You know it is. What do you do with that preacher? Trust God. Talk to him. Don't ever give up. 
call on his holy name. Satan will put a lie in front of you and divert you and keep you from ever trusting the Lord. And if he can do that, he's destroyed you. You say, well, preacher, it's been a long time. It was a long time for that sister right over there. But God worked a miracle. Amen. This one at the pool of Bethesda was 38 years. God worked a miracle. I've been praying for people for decades, and I'll never give up. God can work a miracle. Amen. Amen. And every time he does, I love him more because I learned something about him. I learned something about him. All right, I'll close with this one. And that is your position. What's that, preacher? Well, your position in the Lord will have a lot to do with what you receive from him. So what do you mean? Let's take Gideon in the Old Testament, Gideon. He started out, I think it's 22,000. You've heard that story a thousand times. God said, now Gideon, you got too many. You remember? You want to fight the Midianites? God said, you got too many, Gideon. Gideon was like a lot of generals. He thought to himself, now hold on, Lord. <laughs> I'm going up against an army over here of 30 or 40,000. You want me to cut down from my 22,000? Back in the Civil War, they had a, a northern general. His name was Little Mac. His name was McClellan. He was the commander of the Army of the Potomac. The Army of the Potomac in the Civil War was the largest northern army on earth. Just like when Robert E. Lee uh, commanded the Army of Northern Virginia, that was the largest southern army on earth. So the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia represented the strength of the Confederacy and it represented the strength of the, of the North. McClellan was the commander of the Army of the Potomac. He was in a place called the Peninsula. And they were there and, and, and President uh, Lincoln wanted him to attack Richmond. He wanted him to go down there and take Richmond because Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. And in Richmond, Virginia, by the way, the, the capital of the Confederacy, folks, only about 110, 120 miles from Washington, D.C. It's amazing how close those two capitals were to each other. Well, here's what McClellan said. He said, well, now, it's okay. I'll be glad to go down and assault, uh, assault Lee's army and, 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 and assault these other troops. He said, but you're going to have to give me some more troops. McClellan had a hundred and th something thousand, I think approaching 200,000 troops. He was loaded to death with troops, but you see, he was afraid to go down and fight. He felt like he needed more. He wouldn't fight. And that was one of Lincoln's duties all through the Civil War. One of his biggest problems was to find a general that would fight. And you know who he found? Grant. Grant would fight. Grant fought. Now, this is what's going on with Gideon. Gideon said, now, hold on, Lord. You expect me to go up against the enemy with 300 troops? And that's what it came down to, the ones who lapped like a dog, 300 troops. Lord said, that's what's going to happen. Do you know why? It's this principle, folks. God's got to reduce you from your physical, mental, experiential ability down to simply trusting him like a little child to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And whatever it takes to get you down there, he'll get you down there to where you can trust him like a little child. He'll take your strength away. Has he been working on yours? Has he been working on your achievements? Has he been working on your personality? Been working on your friends? working on your traditions, working on your reputation, has been working on you. He's reducing you to where he can do something for you. And I say, let him do it. Like Clarence Sexton says out there, the pastor of Temple Baptist Church and Powell, good man, good man, served the Lord for decades. You know what Clarence Sexton said to me? And I've said to you before, he said, I died, preacher. He said, I died. He said, I died and God brought me back. He said, you know what happened when I came back? He said, I discovered that a lot of things just don't mean that much anymore. Get your priorities right. There's an awful lot of this stuff out here, that, folks, that just doesn't matter. In thy name we pray. Bless your word and bless your people. In Jesus' name we ask it. And amen. Stand up this morning.